Welcome everyone to this uh, third part of uh, the, a course about uh, another city at uh, People's University, Folkets Universitet, um, which is uh, an independent initiative that uh, has originated uh, around Folkets Hus and uh, we just started and uh, we have two courses. The other one is about uh, Socratic uh, wisdom, uh, and um, which takes place in, in Folketshus um, the first Sunday every um, month. And uh, this one takes place in uh, around the city. Uh, so the first part was in, um, in the people's meeting in Sydhavn about that area as a laboratory for um, alternative uh, living. And uh, the second one was about uh, Fredens Havn, a uh, harbor of peace in Holmen, uh, a self-organized floating settlement there. And this uh, third one is about the history of the squatter movement and the struggle to uh, remake the the city uh, today and um, <clears throat> uh, I'm uh, organizing this course I'm an architect and I work with alternative forms of urbanization uh, I've worked a lot in India uh, where you have um, you could say maybe a quarter of the urban population uh, are squatters. That would be around 100 million people because they live uh, in places where they are not entitled uh, to live. They, uh, they are not provided uh, the normal amenities from the municipalities like uh, sewage system, tap water, things things like that. But <clears throat> for me these places represent something really interesting because <clears throat> because of the lack of these amenities people have to be very creative and inventive and um, they have to help each other and also because they generally they have few resources they contribute very little uh, to uh, the environmental destruction and including climate change. So I think as an architect and an urbanist, it's, <coughs> there's uh, a lot of things to learn from these uh, environments and um, I think basically squatting should uh, be like an official strategy of urbanization. I don't know, maybe it wouldn't be squatting really, but uh, I'm really happy we could make this event here. Uh, so first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Ungdomshuset uh, that would be Chris, for instance, uh, for, uh, for hosting this um, uh, event. And um, I want to thank uh, Maria, uh, who uh, made, a, who's not here now, I think, but she made this wonderful poster for the event. And uh, she's also cooking food, food for us. Um, and uh, because of this, I also made, uh, met a lot of uh, interesting older and younger squatters um, and um, last but not least I want to uh, thank Alex um, Vasudevan um, for, uh, for coming here um, and um, Alex he is um, a geographer from Oxford University he's written no less than two books about uh, uh, the squatter movement it turns out that he actually has uh, um, part of his family comes from India as well, uh, but another part comes from Berlin. So um, Berlin has been his starting point, I think, uh, for his venture into this. Um, and uh, he will um, uh, talk about uh, the squatting uh, broadly uh, in in Europe and uh, North America um, and uh, give some different perspectives uh, on that. So um, I will hand over the floor and the mic to Alex if you will 
uh, welcome him. First of all, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Henrik for inviting me to speak this evening and also um, delighted to be speaking in, in, in such a storied historical space and, and the history of this space you know, matters to squatters and housing activists across Europe, North America and elsewhere as well. So it's a real privilege and, and honor to be speaking here this evening and I can't stress that enough. Now, when I was in Copenhagen doing archival research in 2014, I spent some time in the archives of the Workers' Museum, which um, the archives had been relocated to uh, a suburb called Tastrup. Um, so it was right behind, actually, an IKEA, um, strangely enough. And one of the first set of materials that I received when I entered the archive uh, were materials about the Umdomshuse. Um, and the archivist also gave me uh, a model of the original building. There's actually a version of this model upstairs in the library as well. Um, and we actually spent some time putting it together. Um, and so in a very modest way, I've actually been quite literally carrying a version of this building with me for some time. Um, and so as I said, it's a real honor to be able to actually be able to speak here this evening. And this is a, a space, in many ways, that represents and crystallizes a long history of political and housing-based activism in Copenhagen. So what I hope my brief presentation or talk can do this, um, this evening is really not only to speak uh, to uh, the long history of activism uh, that a space like the, the Youth House represents, but also maybe reflect on the urgency of our current conjuncture. We're living through a period of intense housing insecurity, and squatting as a tool, I think, raises some really important questions and maybe teaches us some lessons about how we may construct, quite literally, another city. So there are two things that I really want to do this evening in my brief talk. I want to say a little bit about the history of urban squatting that I've been exploring over the past 10 to 12 years, and why that history still matters today, and what lessons we might learn for organizing or building our cities differently, or finding ways of building an alternative city. In fact, Jakob Ludwigsen, who was involved in the initial occupation of Christiania in September 1971, described that very space as a framework in his own words for an alternative city. So I think these ideas not only run through the history of squatting here in Copenhagen, but I think speak to much bigger questions about what it means to live in cities in more socially just and equitable ways. And as I said, all of this has really acquired a certain urgency today. We're living through an intensifying housing crisis, but equally a moment where the very idea of the city, whether it's Copenhagen, Berlin, Vancouver, New York, whether it's Mumbai, Cape Town or Jakarta, the very idea of the city as a site of radical social transformation is facing an existential threat. Alienation and oppression is a key part of this story and, and a lot of my own work as a geographer has been focused on exploring alternative forms of self-help or self-organization around housing and infrastructure. So what I guess I'm going to try to talk a little bit about this evening is different ways of thinking about how we inhabit the city in more just and equitable ways. And the kind of tools, the kind of practices, the strategies that come with this. Now maybe to say just a little bit more about myself by way of introduction. So I'm a geographer by training. I, I grew up in Canada. Uh, for my sins I grew up in Calgary which is sort of like ground zero of neoliberalism in Canada. And as soon as I was 18, I disappeared as quickly as I could to Vancouver, where I studied at the University of British Columbia. And I trained as a geographer, and I guess a historical geographer, but also as a, an urbanist, someone who studies and explores cities. And, and um, as Henrik very um, kindly uh, said by way of introduction, I, I recently have published two books that look at the history of urban squatting. So the one on the left, the autonomous, the autonomous City, A History of Urban Squatting, and the one on the right, Metropolitan Preoccupations, which is a more focused history uh, of squatting in Berlin. So the one is a more academic book, and then The Autonomous City was written with a, a wider audience in mind. And what I want to do this evening is really use The Autonomous City, as it were, uh, as a platform, as a staging point for my presentation, which is to tell you a little bit more 
um, to argue maybe how we might reclaim a sense of housing that sees the very act of inhabitation, the very act of dwelling, as far more than simply a commodity, um, as, as something that, that we might actually construct something rather different. Um, we may be more creative and experimental in the ways in which we think about cities that challenges the realities of financialization, that challenges the realities of authoritarian neoliberalism. But maybe just to begin, what do I mean by urban squatting? Broadly speaking, I'm talking about the idea of living in or using otherwise a dwelling without the consent of the owner. And historically, squatters take buildings or land with the intention of relative long-term use. And in the face of recent criminalization, squatters are also acutely aware that their choice to take control of their own housing needs has become an increasingly precarious and ephemeral act. So what do I do actually in this book? I think the book really offers a detailed description of the history of the squatting scene in Europe and North America. And what I'm trying to do in the book is really document, to trace the everyday experiences, the practices and sentiments of squatters, and the role that they've come to play in the making of radical political horizons. So what I do is try to follow the practices adopted by squatters, the tactics they deployed, the spaces they created. And to do so, I collected the various voices, the ideas, the practices, and knowledges produced by squatters while retracing the paths of political activism that they themselves often followed. So the book, and the idea of the book is really to invite readers to step in, to think with and alongside squatters whose actions were documented in magazines and posters and films and other sources written and recorded in the white heat of the moment. Now, in this context, I know also that a number of writers have drawn attention to the highly precarious forms of endurance, the highly precarious forms of survival developed by the millions, the hundreds of millions of squatters that continue to live in cities and towns of the global south. And these are accounts that zoom in on the unjust structures of displacement, of exclusion and violence experienced by many squatters, as well as their efforts to eke out a viable life in settings of pervasive marginality. And Robert Neuwirth, the American journalist, reminds us um, that in many ways these were squatters who were exercising their own right to not only um, occupy the city, but to remake it in their own image as well. And I think this is a, a really important point in thinking about the ongoing practices of urban squatters, be it in the global south or in the global north. And of course, there are efforts, more recent efforts, that have, these are the kinds of efforts, I should say, that have captivated many of my colleagues and housing activists and scholars in the global north, who have detected in the kind of self-built, self-organized, self-managed initiatives of residents in places across the global south, they've detected in those practices a source of inspiration for building a more autonomous understanding of city living. And we shouldn't forget, actually, if we go back to the 1960s, squatting, whether it was in the global north or south, was often seen in the same way in the work of architects and planners such as Colin Ward and John Turner. So these kinds of conversations that move between the north and south is something that maybe we can come back to in conversation. Because one of the things that I find really exciting in recent work that, that I've explored is the ways in which activists in the global north are learning from their colleagues in the south and vice versa. And the way in which those practices and solidarities are circulating I think is really powerful and exciting and also incredibly important in an era of hardening borders, of, in an era of intensifying violence against migrants in particular. But set against this backdrop, the squatter movements that first emerged um, in cities in the global north in the 1960s and 70s were admittedly smaller in scale though they played a decisive role in the development of new forms of grassroots urban politics. And it is that story, the shared history of political action, of community organization and collective living that is the main subject of the autonomous city. Now the historical arc of the book retra uh, retraces the emergence of squatting movements that, uh, or squatting that coincided with the rise of new social movements across Europe um, and North America in the late 1960s onwards. And it focuses in part on the major arc of militancy that erupted in the 1970s and 80s. And obviously that history is really important here in Copenhagen as well. Um, and, and how that shaped the practices and tactics adopted by you know, squatters in places like here, Amsterdam, Berlin, Hamburg, and London. And of course these trajectories, these very histories have been 
acknowledged by activists themselves, and particular attention is paid in the book to a new set of practices also adopted by squatters in, in, in the decades that followed, not only the 80s but the 90s and more recently as well, as a response to long-term capitalist restructuring, the dismantling of the social welfare state, and the deregulation and financialization of housing. And so the, the book is organized around a number of site visits to particular cities. So I begin in New York and I end in New York as well. So the, the book in many ways comes full circle. But along the way, we stop in a number of places where we, we, we look at the relationship between you know, the idea of what is a squatter and the history of squatting in London. I talk about social movements and squatting in Amsterdam and Copenhagen. I talk about uh, the intensity of political action that accompanied squatting uh, in Frankfurt and Hamburg. I look at the makeshift DIY practices adopted by squatters in Berlin. I look at the politics of autonomia in Italy. And then I end by looking, and, and coming closer to home for me, um, at, at squatting in, in, in Vancouver, which is a city where I studied, but also a city where squatting took place in the context of settler colonialism, which raises some very different sets of issues. If you ask indigenous people in, in North America um, uh, who's squatting, they would say the people who, who came um, in the 15th century onwards are squatting on their land already. So the question of occupation has a very different meaning um, in the context of settler colonialism. And like I said, I, I, I come full circle by returning um, to New York in the book. So the, the book is a series of site visits uh, that, that narrate, if you like, the history of squatting based practices in various cities. And it's, I think, an attempt to try to write a radical history of urban politics, but also to serve as a kind of tool book or a guide to how we might begin to work our way out of the, the kind of straitjacket that is the current housing crisis, whether it's here in Denmark, whether it's New York, London, Berlin, or elsewhere. And I guess in one sense that challenge is nothing new. As we know, for the oppressed, the history of housing is a history of insecurity and inequality, but it is also a history of resistance and possibility, one in which squatters occupy an understudied, if really important, place. So we can come back to the discussion of Copenhagen, but I just wanted to maybe provide you with some kind of uh, foothold in terms of that conversation, which we may take upstairs while we're having some food. Um, so in part of chapter three, I, I, I kind of do a very rapid potted history of the emergence of various waves of squatting here in Copenhagen. And one could plausibly argue, though I think there is space to unpack this, that there are various moments in that history, from the early history of squatting in the 1960s to the first major wave of squatting in the 1970s, which has, I think, two different moments, one associated with the setting up of the free town of Christiania, but also one squarely located uh, in, the, in the neighborhood of Nurebro, um, where you see community grassroots activism you know, channeling and, and serving as a key point of development uh, for um, a, a squatting movement in that neighborhood. And I think while those two different moments intersected and interacted, I think they speak to rather different histories of occupation as well. Um, moving forward in time to the 1980s, we see the emergence uh, of, a, of a major wave of squatting that we associate with the BZ movement, which ebbs and flows by the late 80s and early 90s, and finally a third wave of autonomous actions, of which the youth house remains a key site of political organization and action. Now that's really just a kind of broad brushstrokes history, but I think in the context of some of the arguments I want to make this evening, I think it's useful to at least provide that context. So, as I was saying, I, I, I sort of brought some images from some of my archival work. Obviously, the, the free town of Christiania is really important to the story uh, of uh, housing-based activism in this city, as are housing struggles in Nurebro. And, and what's really interesting is that in the National Archives here in Copenhagen, the, the Nurebro Baboa Aksion, uh, all their archival materials have been do donated to the National Archives. So there's a really rich repository of materials that speak to the history of community activism um, in that neighborhood. And I think that story is one that deserves further attention as well. And of course, if we move forward in time to the BZ movement, this is actually a list compiled by Rene Karpanchev and, 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 uh, Karpanchev and Mikkelsen, who, which are, I think, two of the most important common, uh, commentators on the history of, of squatting in Copenhagen. And here we just have a, a sense of the different houses that were occupied um, in the early 1980s to 1990s. Um, and again, that history, I think, is really important. We can come back to it. Unfortunately, I can't. Um, yeah. It, 
This is actually, this slide is from a report that was produced by the secret police in Denmark, actually, uh -huh. which has written one of the most detailed accounts of the history uh, of squatting um, in Denmark. It's actually quite richly um, constructed, but we can come back to that. Um, and obviously one of the, the uh, another really uh, useful source of information is the magazine Fingerin, which came out in the 1980s, which w became a key source of information for the BZ movement. So these are the kinds of materials that I was working with in the context uh, of the book project. And of course, um, the youth house, the Umdomshus, um, remains um, in its current form in a really crucial site, and uh, we can come back to that in conversation later on. Um, this is obviously a story about Copenhagen, but what I wanted to do um, right now is maybe say a few more things about uh, what the book tries to do and, and maybe in the context uh, of this course get us to think a little bit more about what squatting can tell us about the alternative city. So I think what I, I have tried to do is maybe summarize that in five different ways. So what I want to do in the remainder of my time is maybe offer five ways, five different ways in which urban squatting might prompt us to think about and inhabit the city differently. And so I kind of wanted to start with the historical, to think about the relationship between the past and the present, and what I've called the archival city. And I guess in my own research, I found that squatters often understood the city itself as an archive of alternative possibilities. And some of the squatted spaces I charted and followed have endured and survived, but sadly many have simply vanished without a trace. And for many squatters and housing activists more generally, holding on to the fragments, holding on to the remainders of those spaces, not to mention the actions um, which animated them, really matters, is really important. And my own research uh, would not have been possible without the tremendous generosity of the many archivists with whom I worked across Europe and North America. And so these are collections that mean a great deal to me. So we have an image here from London. This is InfoShop 56A, um, which was a formerly squatted space, um, which is a repository of archival material on housing and other social movement-based activism um, in London and elsewhere. Or for that matter, the Interference Archive in Brooklyn, which serves a, a very similar function in the context of New York. Um, and these are collections, as I said, that mean a great deal to me, and their survival and use are vital for how we might still come to reclaim our cities. In their longevity and endurance, we might detect something of the radical infrastructure that figures so prominently um, in the pages of the book, or at least I attempt to sketch out. And I don't think it would be a stretch to think of squatters as, I guess, radical custodians of the city. And I'm thinking about the alternative possibilities, the ways that these archives draw people, objects, and stories together, and, and maybe help us remember how we could reclaim and repurpose the built environment. So the sense of the squatter as an urban archivist, I think, really matters to me. The idea that they carry with them a radically different history uh, of cities and the ways in which those collections help us still to develop tools for reimagining urban life, I think, is really important. And the way in which they do so is, is, is deeply practical. It's about making different kinds of political spaces, of building, quite literally, uh, a, another city. And in this context, this really takes me to my second point, what I've called the makeshift city. And that we need to understand the actions of squatters, and I say this as a geographer, as being geographically or spatially generative. And I guess what I mean is that, that they quite literally tried to build or produce a different kind of city, or a different understanding of, of what a city in its built environment could be, an understanding that was often makeshift, was often deeply precarious, but also in some ways creative and experimental. And uh, I think there's a, a great deal that we can learn from this makeshift urbanism, as I would call it. And so I guess for many squatters, a very active occupying a space offered an opportunity to rebuild, to reimagine the often heavily damaged spaces they were occupying. So squatting in their eyes was a makeshift process of mending, a makeshift process of repair as materials, as infrastructures were often incrementally, slowly, painstakingly added to satisfy basic needs and possibilities. And houses were often slowly restored using a combination of DIY practices. So this is actually an image um, from the Lower East Side in New York. Um, and many of these um, projects um, were legalized in the 1990s as many of these houses were purchased by squatters for one American dollar. The caveat being that they had to restore these buildings and satisfy local building codes. 
And so this process of repair and rehabilitation was something that was very significant in the remaking of these spaces. It depended on the sharing of materials, of practices and know-how between squatters. And throughout the 1970s and 80s in particular, squatters across Europe um, and, and North America produced their own handbooks um, and manuals. And so anyone familiar with the London squatting scene, the squatters handbook provides a kind of blueprint and a sharp critique in many cases of urban planning with a commitment to providing the very basic tools and practices uh, for generating alternative forms of collective self-management. So the Squatters Handbook is now in its 14th edition, was first produced in London in 1976 by the Advisory Service for Squatters and, and it offered detailed practical and legal advice for anyone uh, seeking to take control of their own housing needs. Now the equivalent in, ha uh, in Amsterdam was this Dutch Handbook for Squatters from 1960. Nine, um, and it combined a series of rough and ready instructions into how to repair a house with information on planning and housing policy in Amsterdam. And again, for New Yorkers, um, that guide was called Survival Without Rent. That served as a step-by-step -step guide for would-be squatters in the Lower East Side in the mid-1980s. And in West Berlin in the early 1980s, squatters famously adopted the slogan, it is better to squat and mend than to own and destroy. Lieber Instand besetzen als kaputt besitzen. And they also used for the first time the term Instand Besetzung to describe their actions. And the term itself is a clever combination of the German for maintenance, Instandsetzung, and squatting Besetzung. And produced um, uh, their own how-to instructions in, in, in one of the periods, Squatter magazine. So this is the Instand Besetzer post, which once again instructed taught squatters how to repair and rehabilitate the spaces they were occupying. And in fact, there was a, a handicraft collective in Kreuzberg at the time where squatters could go and pick up building materials, learn the requisite skills to either reconnect the electricity, um, you know, do joisting, fix a roof, you know, fix a window, fix the floorboards, um, connect the, as I said, connect the water as well, and so on. So these kind of very basic DIY skills of kind of relearning the city in different ways was a really important part of the story. And as one commentator has recently suggested, the booklets, the guides and manuals, these kinds of images that were produced by squatters represented a blueprint for an alternative urbanism that they were themselves responsible for constructing. And so I think this is a really important part of the story about this kind of makeshift city built by squatters, that it comes from this kind of practice. Um, and so the built form in this context really serves as a guiding frame for the creation of new sustainable structures of organizing, of working and living. And squatted buildings were often re-engineered to suit the changing needs and wishes of their inhabitants. So for example, K77 Kastaninale um, in, in the former east uh, of Berlin, they actually had moving walls so that er every couple of years they would reorganize the space of the building. Um, to meet the needs of the inhabitants. So there was a sense that that space was in some sense plastic or malleable. So when I talk about the idea of a makeshift urbanism, I'm interested in how ordinary citizens took control of their own housing needs. But the kind of spaces they developed, often in the face of intense repression, pointed to alternative forms of living and dwelling. So that question of the makeshift city also raises bigger questions about solidarity, connection, and what I describe as infrastructure building. So, and this takes me to really my third way which we can begin to learn something from the history of squatting. And squatting, I think, represents far more than just uh, an exercise in architectural experimentation, however important that was. The improvised spaces assembled by squatters were undoubtedly creative and playful, but this was a legacy that extended far beyond the walls of squats to encompass the wider networks of social spaces they generated. So the broad spectrum of sites um, and activities developed by squatters spoke to an expansive social infrastructure that offered an alternative to the one routinely explored by contemporary urbanists. So infrastructure is often a buzzword that you hear geographers and urbanists talk about, but they're talking about a rather different understanding of cities than the ones constructed by squatters. So again, whether it's London, New York, Berlin, or Copenhagen, this was an infrastructure that assumed a number of forms, including alternative bookshops, cafes, cinemas, community gardens, concert venues, cycle repair shops, daycare centers, galleries, neighborhood social centers, workshops, children's zoos, etc., etc., etc. 
And so therefore, as a kind of genre of urban infrastructure, squatting thus spoke to a form of, I guess, architectural activism that combined community design and participation with an understanding of the built environment as a source of continuous invention and reinvention. So I guess squatters were responsible for spaces that often endured and thrived, that were even legalized in some cases or normalized by municipal authorities. And of course, there's much more we can say about that process maybe in conversation as well. But I guess I'm kind of interested in a kind of participatory open source architecture here, which was cu cultivated by squatters. And we need to be careful not to romanticize it, because obviously the reuse of abandoned buildings, temporary spaces, and disused lots for the development of alternative practices and events has also played a decisive role in the neoliberal restructuring of major cities in the global north. So often the radical openness of squatted spaces has in recent years been captured um, by the creative industries and co-opted by municipal planning de departments and city marketing campaigns. And almost that kind of squat aesthetic as well has been captured in, in, in a whole series of commercial spaces. So for example, there's a, there's a, a beer company in the UK called Brewdog. And, and they definitely try to cultivate an aesthetic um, that looks very much like a Berlin squat, you know, the kind of brick walls, the kind of, you know, the, 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 the very conspicuous lighting and so on. So that kind of aesthetic is being recycled and repackaged in new ways as well. So there are some dangers here, which I might come back to later on as well. Um, so squats not only conferred much needed social capital, they also became um, vital assets in many cases in the regeneration and marketization of urban landscapes. But saying all that, there's still much to be gained from a return to some form of self-built housing as a means to reclaim a more sustainable understanding of the city. And I guess this is more of a call maybe for a radical rethinking of the role of architecture and housing. Squatters, especially in the 1970s and 80s, were often closely allied with architects and urban planners in developing autonomous self-managed spaces. In fact, many squatters were in fact architects and planners themselves. And I think much of this ethos has in recent decades been lost in favor of spectacular event-based forms of architecture that have done little to address basic housing needs. You don't see you know, the big architectural firms building social housing. It has no cachet. Um, and, and I think there is something about trying to repurpose architecture for these kinds of ends that really matters. And so I guess it's clear that there, what we really need is a move to reconnect and embed architecture with wider movements for the right to housing. And some of this has already begun. So I was thinking of the recent work of the London-based architectural collective Assemble. Um, and they recently collaborated with a group of pensioners from Berlin who had squatted a community center in 2012. These are a group of people whose average age ran between 63 and 92. And so they squatted this community center in 2012. And they began a project working with Assemble a few years later. Um, and, and it was a really interesting project about trying to construct a, not a multi-generational home, but a, 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 a kind of community home for pensioners and what that space might look like. Another example maybe is a makeshift protest camp at Kottbuser Tor in Berlin Kreuzberg which was formed by a group of social housing residents, including many from the local German-Turkish community. And that self-built space has become a neighborhood social center and a key organizing base in citywide struggles against housing inequality and enduring forms of structural racism. So I guess what I'm trying to get at here is, is, is just the ways in which we can begin to think about or point to a particular relationship between architecture and urban infrastructure. And, and, and again, this is an image from Berlin in the 1980s, which I think captures the sense of, of, of a kind of collective reanimation of urban infrastructure, rehabilitating occupied spaces in Berlin Kreuzberg. And the very idea that the city could be something else, not a kind of atomized, alienated space, but one that brought people together as a kind of space, uh, a conviviality, a, a, a kind of radical space of connection, if you like. And this is one of my favorite photographs from, from the New York squatting scene. These are a group of squatters who had just managed to reconnect the electricity and they were just celebrating the fact uh, that they'd been able to connect their building to the electricity grid. And that sense of shared uh, ownership of that space, if you want to call it that, a sense of we are repairing the space and we're engaging in a form of, uh, of producing a kind of urban commons, I think is really important. And I think what we see, or what we can begin to see here, is a kind of sense of arch architectural practice that will allow ordinary people to take control of their own lives. I think that's where I get the sense of autonomy from in the book as well, uh, and shape their own basic housing needs. It would place architecture at the service of a larger project to remake and transform the city. 
And this takes me to maybe my fourth lesson in the context of some of the work I've been doing and, and that informed the autonomous city, which is to think about the question of refuge and solidarity. That squats were a place, uh, I call it in the book, of, of collective world making, a place to express anger and solidarity, a place to explore new identities and different intimacies, a place to share new feelings, to defy authority and to live autonomously. And again, squats were often sites of intense debate and disagreement, though they were also sites of care, of connection and solidarity. These were places where people argued, they fought, they disagreed, but they also came together. And the history of squatting has always been characterized by its sheer diversity, attracting not only students, apprentices, runaways, workers, dropouts, anarchists, punks, gay and lesbian activists, queer and trans groups, black nationalists, migrants, refugees, and environmentalists. And that sense of diversity is, I think, really important to thinking about these kinds of spaces. So for example, if we want to think about the, maybe, I guess, the lens of critical race or feminist theory, it could be argued that various struggles over squatting in London, for example, um, uh, took those questions very seriously, or those questions wove their way, wove their way or weave their way through those histories. Um, though, in many cases, those histories have often been neglected um, in the context of the wider archive. So, for example, maybe to try to re reestablish the issues or the entanglements of race, class, gender, and sexuality in these wider histories, we can think of perhaps the work of the East London uh, feminist group, uh, Big Flame which were developing new ways of working and living and organizing in the early 1970s. And the East London uh, big flamer ELBF was active um, in, in the mid-70s and they were involved in a number of different struggles that extended far beyond the workplace and included squatting on their own behalf and to support homeless families in the occupation of empty houses and abandoned blocks of flats. Or we could think about the various histories uh, of, of queer politics in 1970s London um, and the questioning of queer sexual identities that emerged in this period. So the Gay Liberation Front, or the GLF, was um, first set up in, in the early 1970s at the London School of Economics. And while that group dissolved in the early 1970s, the spirit of that organization was carried forward by local neighborhood groups in London and established um, spaces in places like Brixton, Notting Hill, and Bethnal Green. And in Brixton, beginning in 1974, members of the South London uh, GLF squatted a number of dilapidated back-to-back -back houses on Railton and Mayo Road, which were home to over 60 men and were later converted into a housing cooperative. They also set up the South London Gay Community Centre at 78 Railton Road, which opened in March 1974 and was evicted in April 1976. And again, this was a key site within the early history of radical queer community organising in South London and part of a wider geography of protest in Bri Brixton. Of course, we also need to think about the fact that many of these histories have traditionally been colorblind, overlooking the role, by, uh, the role played by communities of color within London's squatting community. So it was after all on Railton Road, that same road in Brixton, that Olive Morris, seen here in this image on the left, and Liz Turnbull, members of the British Black Panthers movement, squatted an empty flat. This was the first successful squat of a private property in Lambeth, um, and, and Morris and Turnbull were involved in a number of other occupations and evictions over the course of the next few months. Um, and they uh, played a really important role uh, within the local community in organizing housing-based activism. And this is to say nothing of another organization that they were connected to, which was known as Black Roof, which was an organization that played an instrumental role in coordinating and defending black squatters living in Brixton and Clapham, or the Race Today Collective, which was started in the same year, and was also located on Railton Road in Brixton. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that we need to rethink you know, these struggles uh, around issues of race, class, <coughs> and gender and sexuality. But we also, I think, need to weave in stories about the role that migrants have played in housing struggles, which has often been underreported within the wider literature. Whether we're talking about Sur Surinamese migrants in the Amsterdam district of Bilmer or the role played by migrants in a wide range of struggles in West Germany in the early 1970s, not to mention the recent role that migrants have played <coughs> excuse me, in housing-based activism in, across Spain and especially in cities like Bar Barcelona and Madrid. And again, this is to say nothing of the role that squatting has played in providing an urgent and necessary alternative um, to dominant anti-immigrant policies that seek to deny asylum seekers and refugees their agency to shape the city on their own fragile terms. 
So across Europe, a number of squats have been set up. Uh, many of them have now subsequently been evicted. And, but many of these spaces were set up as spaces of refuge and hospitality for, <coughs> excuse me, for forced migrants who often found themselves in political limbo or unable to access local services. So I guess what I'm trying to say is we need to ask ourselves why the experiences of migrants have been largely marginalized within wider squatting histories and how these histories might also maybe reveal the limits and possibilities of new forms of occupation and their relationship to enduring forms of housing precarity as well. So I think that issue of what it means to think about care and refuge and solidarity and how we think about those issues in the context of squatting based activism is really, really important. And one of the lessons and one of the things that I didn't get or I didn't attend to as much as I would have liked in, in the book and I think is really important in trying to reactivate the actions of, uh, uh, or the practices of squatting as a toolkit for reimagining the city today. But I also wanted to maybe just say a little bit about the other side of this conversation that also emerged not only out of the archival work but to the many squatters I spoke to in the context of various, you know, the various places I visited and the interviews that I did as well that accompanied the project. And I guess we should also be careful not to romanticize squatting. We should not sidestep the sheer precarity that many have historically faced in seeking adequate forms of housing and shelter. And again, this is a point that has really been brought home in recent years by the experience of refugees squatting in Southern Europe in particular. The history of urban squatting was often brutal and violent and brought squatters into direct contact with the elementary brutalities of an economic and legal system that sought to repress them, whether it's through evictions, through street battles, and other forms of violence. More, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that squatted spaces were also sites of intense disagreements between squatters that were in many cases divisive and violent in their own right. And finally, as the history of squatting in a city like Vancouver reminds us, the evidential realities of settler colonialism shed light on another dimension uh, of the history of urban squatting. The resettlement of British Columbia in the 19th century um, took place without the ceding of territory, the signing away of land by indigenous peoples. So in other parts of Canada, indigenous communities, um, they, there were treaties where that land was ceded to the authorities and to the crown, but not in British Columbia. So paradoxically, you have a radical squatters and housing activist movement in Vancouver, but in the eyes of First Nations communities, everyone in Vancouver is squatting on their land, quite literally. And actually, from a legal point of view, they have a very powerful case to make. And I think we shouldn't lose sight of this story as well, that in settler colonial states, be it Canada, the US, um, or for that matter, even Australia, that is a story of occupation and squatting, which, which also tells us a story about another form of violence. And that sometimes housing activists have neglected to take seriously the voices of indigenous communities who actually have a lot to say uh, about the relationship of squatting to their own lands. So I think there's something about that dark side that we at least need to register and take seriously in the context of some of the stories and some of the lessons we can learn for our own forms of activism as well. But I want to end obviously on a more um, positive note in terms of the kind of ways in which we can think about urban squatting as a means, as a tactic, as a tool for reclaiming the right to housing. Setting aside the criminalization of squatting for the moment, I think there is something about the enduring value of direct action of occupation as a form of protest, as an action that, that tells us a lot about how we might imagine cities differently, despite and perhaps because of the precarious context in which these tactics actually operate. And so I, I'll leave you with a couple of images of, uh, of, of actions closer to home in the context of the UK where I now live. Um, this was an occupation that took place um, in Newham, which is a neighborhood on the edge of the Olympic site in, 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 in London by a group of single mothers who are being displaced from that community um, to make way for you know, fancy new housing. Um, and, and so they occupied some of the social housing that was about to be dismantled um, in a series of protests that garnered a lot of attention um, uh, in, in the UK at the time. I think spoke to a recognition that ordinary citizens um, in, in the UK were taking these matters into their own hands um, and, and doing so in ways that were very powerful and potent in the context of, of an enduring and intensifying housing crisis. Um, and also um, related to that, the work of, of a group called Sisters Uncut, 
who are drawing attention to the relationship between austerity and housing insecurity, the way in which cuts to social services uh, and to women facing domestic violence also had an impact on their ability to find safe and secure housing. And so again, the ways in which squatting was being used as a tool for political action is very important here. And so perhaps in these examples, and there are numerous others we can, we can, we can collate and bring together, we can begin to think about, and this is what I hope the book tries to do, and maybe this is the kind of conversation we can have afterwards as well, of uh, uh, what it'd be like to try to imagine a different kind of city that was res responsive to people's basic needs and desires for living maybe differently, living collectively, sharing um, and, and in ways that imagine not only the city as a space of political possibility, but also as a, as a space perhaps of ecological change as well. And perhaps this is really what I'm trying to get at when I talk about the autonomous city, is to try to articulate and find ways of recovering the energies that we associate with the actions of squatters. I mean, these are histories that have ebbed and flowed, but they tell us a lot about how we might build different cities. And I'm going to leave it there, um, and, and thank you very much. And the only thing I want to say by way of conclusion is just um, a, a kind of note of solidarity to our comrades in Berlin at Liebig 34, who are facing potential eviction um, in the courts next week, and so I wish them all the best. Um, and also to our colleagues here in Copenhagen who are marching for various causes this evening as well. So again, thank you for your patience um, and thank you for having me speak this evening. I really appreciate it. Thank you.